Research Fund. And uh, she's here to talk about her work in Pikes Funding.
these three different sites. And currently we're managing over 50 hectares of wetland uh, independently of the main river of water uh, regulation. And so moving forward, I'm gonna talk about data from our Carpenters Branch uh, site, as pictured here. Um, this is sort of our longer uh, data set that, and it's sort of representative of what's going on in the other, uh, the other marshes. And I have to mention real quick that uh, the rest of the people we work with, um, so DEC, Thousand Islands Land Trust, Fish and Wildlife Service, Ducks Unlimited, they're really the ones that are helping us maintain these control structures, and we couldn't do any of this without them. Okay, so to sort of evaluate how these are working, we set spillway traps, as pictured here, just below the water control structures in the spring during that migration period to capture emigrating fish. And so this data is showing you our long-term data set of our emigrating uh, uh, age zero northern pike coming out of the Carpenters Branch uh, marsh. And as you can see, early on we had really, um, really nice high peaks numbers of fish coming out of these, uh, this managed marsh. But recently we've seen this collapse. And honestly, we, we're actually not really sure why this has happened. We, I'm going to speculate a little bit, but this is, um, we're doing everything the same and we're not really sure why they're not functioning the way they used to. And so one factor that may be <coughs> contributing to this is we're also seeing uh, lower numbers of spawning adults running up into these managed marshes. So we also monitor uh, adult migration using trap nets uh, during this, the spring migration run uh, every year. So this data is showing you the long-term adults adult um, northern pike. And uh, so, so you see this associated decline in the number of adults running up the marsh, so into the marsh. So this may be one reason um, why we're seeing less juveniles. The other thing that I don't have up here is we're also, in the number of, in the, the adults that are running into these marshes, there also is a unbalanced uh, <coughs> skewed female uh, sex ratio. So there's more females than males. It's almost like, it's almost two to one actually. So this unbalanced number of um, breeding population may also explain the recent failure. And so despite less pike coming out of our managed marshes, we are seeing other positive ecological responses uh, by holding the water levels higher. Uh, we've seen uh, an increase in muskrat activity, marsh birds, amphibians, reptiles, all sorts of species are responding to this management. So it's a really positive in that way. And the area of impact that we're able to restore with a, just one water level control structure is, and you'll see in the future um, techniques that I'm talking about, is can be really substantial. And so that, that's a real big positive of this relatively easy passive technique. Some cons are they, these structures do require um, quite a bit of maintenance sometimes, especially when there's fever activity or, or floating cattail blockages, as pictured here. Our lab manager are trying to dislodge one of those. Um, and so, and, and, and obviously the fact that they're not having been working uh, the way we expected them to uh, in recent years. Okay, so moving on. So the next technique that we've been evaluating is channel excavation. And this work is done um, using an aquatic excavator as pictured here. Um, the work's been done by the Fish and Wildlife Service Partnership Fish and Wildlife Program. And so, We've a bit, so the, the key to this technique is that it actually uses, we use historical aerial imagery to reconnect, recreate connections uh, in the wetland that existed previously and try to restore access to that spawning habitat that still exists. So this technique has been used in two geomorphic types. The first um, is in drowned river mouth tributaries where we are reconnecting the main channel to this remnant um, uh, native wet meadow that still exists in our wetlands. So these channels here are aiming to reconnect this habitat to the main, the main channel there. And then the second way we use this technique is to restore movement um, of water and fish between bays that have lost a connection due to the type of encroachment. So here's Club Island showing you this used to be an island with a connection here. It's been grown in with typha and we've reconnected that using the excavator. The second um, benefit of this uh, technique is that the excavator itself actually takes the underlying spoil and casts it onto the riparian floodplain, mm -hmm. and and this um, is causing quite a disturbance, which is which is really we're hoping that um, 
this disturbance will promote the regeneration of native vegetation, or at least promote new vegetation, uh, besides the monotypic cattle stands that we're seeing. <clears throat> and so the biggest question was, are the channels providing habitat for northern pike to rebreeze in? We weren't really sure would the pike utilize these channels or not. And the answer is yes. And we were really, really excited about this. Not only are the pike using these channels, but they're using them immediately. So projects that were done uh, you know, in the, in the winter, pike were already spawning, or at least we were catching emigrating pike coming out um, in, the, in that spring of that year. And so we monitor the, the channel, we've been monitoring some of the channels uh, the same way we do this with the uh, managed marshes, by just setting uh, nets that are capturing emigrating fish. And as you can see, um, this is showing you just CPU of our northern pike in the managed versus, we also set the nets at reference sites just to get an idea of how they fare with what's going on naturally. Um, in addition to the pike using the channels, we're also seeing 21 other fish species over the or we've seen 21 other fish species using these channels over the course of these three years that we monitored them, so that was really positive. The other question we had was how does the riparian uh, floodplain, where the excavator has sidecast the spoil material, how does that respond? Um, and so what we did was we set permanent vegetation uh, plots along restored channels, and we, also, and we did this also at reference sites. And we looked at, at how the vegetation was, was responding. And so this, is, this data is showing you just some of that. We looked at the percent cover of short emergent plants. So these are your native sedges and grasses that are the preferred habitat that we're hoping to uh, regenerate. And we actually saw a significantly higher percent cover of these plants um, along restored floodplains versus reference. And this persisted over the course of five, over five years. So this was a really, really positive uh, response that we were really hoping to see and we saw. So just quickly, yeah, the, the pros of channel excavation um, from our evaluation has been, yes, a positive fish and vegetation response. We've also seen improved DO conditions in these um, channels that we've created that have promoted flow and the movement of fish between abatements. A real cool thing about this technique is not only are we reestablishing a connection that's been lost, but we're providing, uh, facilitating new habitat growth. And it's cool because we're mimicking natural historical, the natural historical landscape. So we're creating channel connections that existed historically. Some cons, again, are they're not perfect. There's definitely situations where these channels have grown in with, with cattail or become blocked with debris, and they do require some maintenance. In, in some cases, we're out there twice a year uh, removing all the, the stuff that's piled up in these channels. So they can require quite a bit of maintenance to keep them uh, open. And then the other thing is that they are water level dependent. So we're not managing the water levels independently. So they're really reliant on, in dry, in dry years, the channels may not become inundated with water and, and be functioning the way they're, they're supposed to. Okay, so the third technique I'm gonna talk about today is uh, spawning pools. <coughs> and this work is, is really cool. So we, um, we've been evaluating this for the past couple years now. This work was done by Ducks Unlimited uh, through a NOAA uh, grant through GLRI. And uh, we've got ESS been evaluating these for, for a couple years now. And the point of these is to create more open water habitat. So the channels were kind of limited, you know, by the equipment and, and sort of the design. But with the, the spawning pools, we're able to create more open water habitat, more edge habitat. Um, this is showing you an example of one of the complexes that we're, we're studying. So the, this is French Creek, um, showing you a before of sort of the monotypic cattail marsh that's typical of our drowned river mouth tributaries. The design phase and then the after. So you can see much more open water habitat has been created um, for fish and, and, and access to spawning habitat. <coughs> And so we've been evaluating the spawning pools the same way we've been evaluating the channels um, similarly to the managed marshes by setting these nets and monitoring the out-migration of juveniles. And so, um, again, pike reproduced in these, these channels immediately. So the first year following uh, restoration, we captured emigrating H0 pike coming out of these, these up pools. So it's just been really exciting. Um, they weren't huge numbers, okay, but they're there, so we were pretty uh, excited. 
Um, in addition, 29 other fish species are using these pools, so again, a really positive fish response you've been seeing. Uh, I will point out the really high numbers we saw this past year, so we have really, really good conditions, and like, and like the channels, these are reliant on water, level, water levels. And um, 2014, we had almost 800 fish emigrating out of just 10 pools that we set nets at for a 30-day period. So this was really encouraging, um, and we're really excited about this. So another thing we noticed is that the fish coming out of the spawning pools looked really healthy. Like, they just looked like they were going to town in there. Uh, so we, um, we looked at, so we, this prompted us to look at the length data and compare the lengths of the fish coming out of the spawning pools versus uh, nearby reference sites that, that we also um, monitor for outmigration. And as you can see, we're actually seeing larger size pike emigrating from the spawning pools compared to nearby reference sites. So this was really cool. We also didn't expect to find this either. And, um, and so yeah, maybe the pools are providing um, higher quality nursery conditions. Uh, this is something we want to investigate further uh, in the future. And so some pros, really quick. Uh, positive fish and vegetation response, again, we saw with the, with the restoration technique. Uh, producing the larger size pipe was really exciting. Um, and because these pools are deeper and wider, uh, we're thinking that they may be sustainable a little bit longer than some of the channels that we've seen uh, grow in or, or, or get clogged. Some of the cons is this is a more expensive technique, so it requires you know, more traditional uh, heavy machinery and uh, more of an intense design, design phase. They're also water level dependent, um, and, and the other con to this is we really don't know the long-term sustainability. You know, what will, what's the trajectory of these pools? Will, will they still be there in 20 years from now? We're not sure. Okay, so I just wanted to bring all of this together for you and sort of put all of these techniques on the same playing field. So to do this, we standardized our emigrating pipe data by restored hectare. So, I took each of the techniques and looked at the number of pike per hectare restored. And as you can see, the spawning pools on a per hectare basis are over, outperforming all the other techniques, well, in 2014 um, in any other year. So this, this is kind of really cool. And so it's not really fair to compare these to the, the spawning marshes which haven't been working well in recent years. So I, took, I looked at the peak data from when the managed marshes were producing pike, and compared that to the spawning pools. And that's where the white line is. That's where Carpenter's Branch fell out in 2005 when it was at its peak, and how it compares on a per hectare basis um, to the spawning pools. And the spawning pools are still doing, doing better. So that was, that's kind of cool to, to know. Okay, so in conclusion, um, the managed marshes are not meeting uh, expectations in recent years. Um, as far as emigrating pike, but they are uh, providing uh, ecological benefits for other species in the, in the marsh. The channels and spawning pools, if you build it, they will come. It's awesome. So we're really excited about that. Uh, but the downside to all this is the, the recovery of the population is, is still constrained by system-wide system -wide problems. Um, the continued suppression of water levels, and then that set, sex ratio imbalance that um, Go to the poster session tonight. You'll hear uh, one of our students. She's actually studying this more intensely, and uh, um, it's really important. So you can hear about that later. So what's next? Um, we want to see more of these kind of connectivity enhancements go through. Uh, now that the research is there to support that they are actually working, um, we're, we're excited to evaluate more of them if they get they get funded. Mm -hmm. uh, there's hundreds of potential projects in the river. There's hundreds of these drowned river mouth tributaries that are cattle dominated and in need of restoration. Um, the other thing is, we think that pike are, you know, producing at low levels at lots of places along the river. So that's what's keeping the population going. So each each of these individual projects may be really important to the, the keeping the population uh, sustained. The managed marshes, we need, to, we need to look more into that, what's going on. We may try some different things, um, tracking and transferring, stocking eggs. We're, we don't know, we got, we got some work to do out of there. 
And, and overall, what, what is the contribution of pike coming out of these enhancements to the adult population? We don't know that yet either, so that, that's, stay tuned. Uh, and then the spawning pools, because they've been so successful, will they work to enhance other populations, um, and, and specifically muscle, which is something that we may uh, be looking into in the future. All right, I'm out of time, so I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources, um, our partners, and of course, TIB staff, students, past and present. This is a lot of work that is not all because of me. Uh, 